off from work and, and go and do this other consulting thing if it's going to help people do better with them. What sort of clients would you expect to have? I mean, are you thinking large enterprises or startups? Or, or you... So I can tell you, like, the kind of approaches we had so far. We already have, like, five to ten emails of companies that are really serious about getting our our services, and they're dramatically different, to be surprising. For instance, we had talks with people that are trying to port a Facebook application that they run on PHP because they think that the streaming model is going to really help them deliver more music in real time. Or we have a large blogging network from Chile that might be interested in talking to us and actually migrate their things to Node, and they want to know that they can do it right, that it actually works, so they can get our expertise to actually know, so does this work, and how do we do it? How do we pull it off? So we don't. We think that enterprise will be more interested in this. So maybe telcos or energy, energy. But we're at this point not sure. But those are the kind of companies that are right now reaching out to us. Companies that want to migrate to Node, and they recognize that there is this gap, and they're like, okay, you're leveraging the gap that I was really afraid of. Please come here and help me do this. Your team can help us. Yeah, we've had a few people already make make a comment like, this is exactly what we need actually. And and I think. Um, you know, we, we are going to stretch the scale between startups and enterprise, I think. I think we're going to get a few big big customers that really want us to go in and, you know, do a training for like 30 people so that they can all learn Node. And then we're also going to get a lot of startups that really need architecture help or early code review so that they're not doing things that just aren't kind of best practices. Um, but I think that the key difference here between our services and what you might hire traditional consulting services for and where we wouldn't fit into that is you, you need to have a development team of your own. You know, like we, we're providing services that invest in your team. You know, we're not providing the team for you. We're not writing the code for you. So, you know, a lot of traditional consulting services go to people who have a great idea for a product, or they, and they might have a great design, or they might have great content, but they don't have any developers, and so they hire a consulting firm to do that. And that's not what we're going to do at all. Do you know of any precedent for for this type of firm, like with a with any other language? I mean, it, it seems like a pretty novel idea. Not a lot of other languages, but I think um, some of the services that we provide are a fraction of what other consulting services have done in the past. Um, particular smaller consulting companies that tend to be involved in really early technologies, you know, like, um, like Boas Sender is a very good friend of mine uh, at Boku, who runs like a very successful consulting firm. And they're doing everything from WebGL, HTML5 games to, you know, like phenomenal new stuff with Backbone. And they were one of the first people to sort of do stuff with Node and with Couch. And they really like to invest in really new technologies and take really exciting contracts. And they take longer term contracts, that's their business. But every once in a while, they will do a training or, you know, they will just go in and do one day of on-site something for somebody because, you know, they get that opportunity, but they can't really specialize in it or only do it because, you know, they want to employ those people full time and they want to take on that other work. Um, and it's it's a lot of work to negotiate with companies who want to pay you to come in for a day, right? And having a lot of overhead in that negotiation and in that billing process to do it, you know, hundreds of times a month or possibly um, is just not what, what they want to do, you know? Like, but Boaz definitely does not want to spend all of his time doing, you know, accounting work. So, uh, a thing like you're right that this is a novelty, but it's in a novelty in the sense that the community is running this. It is not necessarily a novelty in enterprise. If you look at enterprises that sell very well to enterprise markets, but because they are in such tip of the top of the enterprise, there's not a lot of developers that know how to do that kind of technology. Well, those kind of companies, software companies, normally provide professional services that look a lot like these to get people ramped up. So that exists a lot in the industry. It's just that normally there's like a big company that actually owns the technology that does these kind of things. And here you have kind of the inverted ways, like the community, the actual experts are scattered ag across different com uh, companies. And the companies just agree that it's in everyone's benefit to actually go and still help the customer succeed, even though it's a technology that is still emerging. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, one of the things that you uh, would be able to help people out with are avoiding common pitfalls. Uh, what are some of the some of the pitfalls or scenarios that that uh, you you've seen a lot? I mean. Certain things that you think would be really obvious by using the API a lot, r really simple things, you know, like uh, when I create a new API that takes a callback, it needs to have the standard callback parameter, you know, one error and one success result callback. And 
a lot of people, you know, they won't, they still won't use those in their own code. Like they'll use them constantly when they're using libraries, but then when they write their own code in their own API, they'll just they'll they'll never give it an argument, or they'll they'll pass it null when there's an error, and that's a really really bad pattern to try and do. You can't mix and you can't mix and match that very well with the core API. You end up swallowing errors when you don't mean to, um, and you know most importantly, you're not able to use a lot of the value that's being created on top of Node um, in the user community because you're not following the same patterns. A lot of other patterns that you see is that people end up rewriting things because they just didn't know about a library that's out there. You know, a lot of I think a lot of our early advisory stuff is going to be telling people about Dnode or you know telling people about Socket IO and, and how you can integrate that with Redis and do sort of distributed real time stuff. A lot of people just aren't comfortable enough knowing that these things exist and end up trying to go and rewrite them when there's a really good one that's really battle tested and being used across a bunch of companies in production that they just don't know about because it's. It hasn't been big enough for their people to see it yet. Okay. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, there's, there's also companies that want to be more involved in the, com in, in the community because they feel like it's safer for them if they're heavily involved in the community and understand what's going on. And I think like this kind of skill will complement what they have. They feel like they can do it, but they feel like it would be good if they had an entry point to the community where they feel really safe. For instance, if they're doing a private NPM store, if they can talk to Isaac, well, Isaac can actually listen to them and help them not only set that up, but he can only maybe reason about something that is missing on NPM that would allow people to have more private registries. So they can get that engagement point that they need in the community because these are open source modules. So they can hook up to open source modules that they couldn't ever do because they were just open source and some handle on the internet. Now they can meet this person and talk with them. So that's also something that people are, or at least they told me that it looks very interesting about the Node firm. Yeah, and we, we also hope that eventually a lot of this, uh, the feedback that we get by doing by you know having these new relationships with new startups and enterprises, we want to feed that information back into the community. You know, like I, I run a bunch of meetups, and we're going to keep doing even more. You know, I run a conference for Node. Like knowing what problems people are running into the most is going to be the best content to have at events like you know meetups and conferences and stuff like that, so that we can start to spread this knowledge more. I mean, like one of the goals of the firm is that eventually any company that we work with won't have to use our services. You know, and hopefully in the future, like you won't even need services like this because everybody, the community will be so grown and involved that you can hire really good people and that everybody's connected. Okay, so Node's been around for, a, it seems like three years now, about, and uh, this is the, you know, the afternoon of the second day of this event, so there's, a, you know, certain things that we've we probably heard a lot over and over again by now. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering, what are you guys, uh, what common misperceptions are you guys tired of hearing about? What uh, what errors are there in the, in the community that you would like to maybe set people straight? Wow, so much. Uh, <laughs> um, I think like one, one of the biggest things that I've heard over and over again uh, is the event model. It's all about the event model. And, and like I really think that most of the people that are talking about that are thinking about the event model from a different language. Um, because like yeah, we have these uh, asynchronous I.O. patterns in Node, but when you're in Node, when you sort of internalize the Node way of doing things, uh, the way that you think about the problem is actually like all I.O. is in callbacks, you know? And all events are actually, you know, when you call emit, that's like a blocking and memory operation and all the listeners have to do something right now and then you're going to move on and do something else. And so events in Node actually are this thing that's not entirely asynchronous. Like yes, when I add a listener to it, it's going to happen sometime in the future, but calling that event is actually not deferred until later and doesn't enter into the event loop. Um, oh man, I'm trying to, now I'm trying to think about a lot of other things that I have problems with and, and I, I should probably not get into too many of them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I think what I'm excited about is that people start focus, uh, start focusing on problems that Node can solve really well, network problems that have, like, high traffic and that can really help companies, like, do businesses that they can't. I've already heard stories about companies that are trying, they have huge Java stacks and they just can't deliver as much information as they can as they need to because of the impedance of all these huge frameworks. And Node is just such a lean way of getting your network programs to deliver so much information. I'm super excited about that. So sometimes I don't get a lot, uh, very excited when people go like and are doing something that, for instance, is very CPU intensive or is just very huge case that you should just use Apache to serve static files. Mm. It's already there, it's very solid, or Nginx, so that's yeah. kind of it. 
I, I think that the only other thing that I would bring up is that uh, because the focus of the conference is on you know getting a lot of people in the business world and the venture capital world uh, comfortable with Node and understanding Node, knowing about Node, all the focus is on core and sort of like what Node offers in core and as a technology and, and how that changes things. But you know there's an order of magnitude more value being created right now on top of Node in in the develop in the module community, um, in things you know like we have the best package manager that I've ever used across any language or platform before um, and you know people haven't really mentioned it that much you know this is like one of the one of the reasons why I've heard people come to node is because this package manager is so nice and, and NPM is just amazing um, and NPM enabled us to build all these other great new modules you know like socket IO like Express um, like Dnode you know they solve all these amazing problems and, and we haven't spent a lot of time talking about that to some end. well we have to take a break now but uh, thanks a lot for your time guys thank hey, you good luck with the node firm yeah thanks <laughs>
Hi, I'm Clint Finley with SiliconANGLE. We're here live on theCUBE, which is our streaming broadcast uh, internet TV show. We cover all the, the latest and greatest in technology. Today we're in San Francisco at the first Node Summit, which is dedicated to Node.js, which is an emerging uh, development platform. I'm joined today by Arno Casimir. He's the founder of Observit. Uh, Arno, can you tell, tell us a little bit about Observit? Um, Observit is a real-time analytics service that not, it's not analyzing your website, but your users, so you're actually insert one line of code in your page, and you can see the user's mouse everywhere on your page, and see the clicks, and uh, scroll down the page, and you see it reflected on your own browser. So it's just like watching over the shoulder of your user. And so, would you uh, compile a lot of statistics from this, or is this just, uh, uh, you re record a lot of the interactions? Uh, sort of, how, do, how does the, the end user the, uh, who's analyzing the traffic, how do they use it? Um, we're sending all the events to our backend, and then you can replay it, just like separate session, or it gets aggregated as heat maps. Okay. And so you were the one of the winners of uh, Node Knockout, the most yeah. recent Node JS development competition. Which categories did you win in? Uh, we won overall, solo, and utility. So you developed the original one yeah. solo, all, all, all in your uh, own. Solo. Okay. Uh, what's your, your background before starting this project? Um, I'm originally a designer, and then I uh, moved from designing to the front end. And then when Node started getting uh, traction, I moved to Node. Okay, so you, uh, you're solving a sort of problem that you would, you would face then as a, yeah. as a web developer, wanting to Definitely. know how people are interacting with sites and applications. Yeah, how they're doing on your site, and, and what is working and what is not working. Okay, and how, how users are converting on your website as well. How does uh, how do you use Node.js in this? Um, our complete services runs on Node.js. We're using Socket.io for the real-time connection between uh, the user and our server, mm -hmm. and we're using Node Canvas to generate heat maps, and we're using the Q service from Learn Boost to process all the information in real time. Hey, is this something that the end user has to opt into, or is this something that it just they, it just starts getting recorded? It just starts getting recorded, so you have to put a little privacy notes in your page that users might be but monitored. The, and so this is all done in, in JavaScript, so there's nothing that the end user has to even download. It's no, just part of... Just one line of code in your page and you're done. How, how well does it perform then? Does it slow the site down? Um, it doesn't slow down the site because we're using WebSockets to send over the information. But of course, you have a little performance hit because you have to download one extra script on your page. Well, what about on the on the users end? Does it? Uh, uh, does you, it? You won't feel any latency when you're moving around on a page. Okay. Will it will it increase the CPU usage or anything like that? No, nope. not not noticeable. Not, not a bit. Yeah, maybe maybe like one two percent. But okay, it's not noticeable. So, uh, where are you going uh, with this with this application now? I know you're you're part of uh, the the node competition here. Yeah. Uh, so are you looking for funding? Do you have yeah, we're funding? Def we're definitely looking for funding. We're currently just bootstrapping uh, the application. And we're just, uh, we're hoping to build it out as a complete service. And uh, by looking for investors, we can just push out uh, the public release sooner. What's, what's the business model going to look like? Will this be sort of a freemium service that people can, you know, you have an entry level tier? Yeah, we have an entry level that's like 100 recordings and then uh, you have to pay for a monthly fee. Okay. Uh, what's on your roadmap for the, for the development? Is there any, uh, do you have any uh, longer term vision for, for what else you want to do with yeah, it? Yeah, we definitely want to continue aggregating the data and getting more useful data out of it, like uh, where your users all are dropping, so you don't have to follow one session to find out, but just uh, an aggregated view of possible interesting sessions for you. And we want to go uh, mobile. It's the new hot thing, so touch, following touches mm -hmm. and uh, emulating that as well. Okay, so I want to go back a little bit uh, to your background, because you said you started out as a designer, and then yeah. you started doing front-end development, and now you're doing back-end development with Node. How hard was were, were each of those transitions? Um, from designing to front end was quite easy because I just always wanted to have my designs pixel perfect. So 
you just have to do it yourself if you want a pixel perfect uh, web pages. And then yeah, Node came, and I just wanted to move on, keep on learning, and uh, it was just a smooth transition from front end to back end. It's just the same language everywhere, which makes it really easy to work with. Is the the whole callback model is that hard to learn? Um, I don't think so. It's just something to get used to, but once you know how it works and what kind of issue you're going to run into, like like these funky uh, call stack trees uh, with nested callbacks everywhere. Because if you just know how to avoid it, it's just simple. Were there, as you were developing Observe It, uh, did you run into any big stumbling blocks with Node, or did it did everything just work pretty seamlessly? Um, the only problem that we had was with hosting that they're not all supporting web sockets, so that's something uh, we were bumping against because the web socket spec kept changing and changing, and not every hosting company can keep updating their stack to uh, support the current WebSocket. Right, and well, not all browsers. Well, uh, are all the major browsers supporting WebSockets now? Yeah, I know true. Mozilla took it out for a while, but they put it back in. Yeah. The uh, Opera is supporting it now? Opera is supporting it, okay. uh, Chrome, so, Safari. Has, it, has the development of it stabilized then, of the spec? Um, the spec is finalized, so that's, okay. uh, that's great news. But there yeah. are always some issues with cross-browser support, even with WebSockets. Okay. There are bugs everywhere, so right. you just gotta be aware of those issues. So but, and that's that seems more like it's more of a front end issue rather than a Node.js issue. Yeah, that's or not true. even not not a front end issue. Just yeah, but you also may got to make sure that the, the, that your back end of Node is up to date with the with all the different WebSocket protocols. Because we got the really old versions of Safari that's using like Draft 75 and uh, the newer one using uh, the latest WebSocket specifications, and you want to support them all to have a great browser support range. Okay. Well, uh, that's all the questions I have. Uh, is, is there anything else you wanted to, to let our viewers know about? No, they can sign up uh, for a beta on uh, beta.observe.it, and uh, we will be we rolling out a beta next week, slowly. Great. Well, good luck with the beta. Yeah, thanks. Right. We're going to take a break.